Hi, good morning, everyone. So great to be here. Now, today we're, gonna, we're in the middle of an Advent series, and Rich spoke about waiting and weakness, and today I want to pick it up. Our, our series is called Advent, the Foolishness of God, and our title uh, today, hmm, oh, sorry. our title today is Hope That Enters a World of Pain, Hope That Enters a World of Pain. So uh, let's just pray and uh, offer our time to Christ. So Lord, thank you for Scripture, which feeds our soul and transforms us the way we just saw in this baptism. It transforms people like Kim. So Lord, feed us that we may uh, offer hope to the world that's in great pain today, that there's a living God who reigns and rules forever and ever. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, right now in the world... Uh, according to the United Nations Refugee Agency, uh, of a world of 7.4 billion people, uh, one of every 113 in the world are either asylum seekers, internally displaced, or refugees. And that we're having the largest movements of people going on in the world since World War II, yeah, at the end of World War II. And uh, I mean, just massive numbers and, and uh, you know, overwhelming numbers. And uh, they say that, according to the United Nations, every minute, 24 people are displaced. Now, is that striking? Or what? 24 people in the world. That means by the time we finish here, another 600, 700 people will, be, will be on, have been displaced and on the move. And, uh, and so we've got, you know, folks at sea who are, you know, as you know, many are dying on sea, just trying to get out uh, and get to places like Europe. Uh, you know, folks trying to cross borders on land. Uh, you know, quite desperate now as countries have closed off, including our own, you know, closed off. And, and, uh, but just, you know, tremendous fear and, and anxieties, and for, it's very complex. But um, uh, many tens of thousands finding their way blocked. Uh, and, and, of course, some have no choice. You know, some it's economics, but many it's just, it's, I mean, what are you going to do if you're living in a place like Aleppo, you know, or Mosul? If you have a chance to get out with your family, you're getting out. Because not a place, not a lot of places to go. And so when you watch these newsreels and, and read the papers, and, and you, you, there's no mention of God. And so it's easy to walk away from that and just feel a sense of despair. Because like, oh my God, just overwhelming. And, uh, but today we're talking about bearing witness uh, of hope in Jesus in a world that's in great pain. And that's really what the first Christmas is all about. Uh, there's really, the, there's a great joy in Christmas. And as you read the Christmas stories in Luke and Matthew, and you know, God has come in the person of Christ. But there's also great pain that's going on in the text we're going to read in just a moment. You'll see it. Uh, but we bear witness to the fact that there's a Lord and a living God who reigns and rules in history. And, uh, you know, do I know why God has millions of people on the move from one country to another? No. Do I understand why the place which was the cradle of Christianity, Syria, Iraq, uh, for 2,000 years, way before us here in the West, uh, why it is under enormous persecution and pressure? Uh, I have no idea what God is doing. But we're living in a day where the world's in, in, in visibly great pain around us. And, uh, but we want to bear witness and go out there, and you're going to hear a term, white helmets. We want to go out there with an offer of hope in the living God who speaks to it. Because God so loved the world, he did send his only son. Uh, that whoever would trust in him might experience eternal life. So God so loves the world. And we love the world. And that's why we're here. And so our, our um, you know, the, the great news of Christmas uh, that we celebrate is that, it's like a, I, I like the, this is the best picture I, I have in my mind of, of what we celebrate every year is, is it's a, a giant, immense V. I mean, you, I don't know how you picture it on a PowerPoint, but think of an immense, glo eternal V that, that becomes a minute, measurable point and pierces time as we know it and lands in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. And the Almighty God uh, miraculously becomes a baby. The divine God becomes a human in flesh. The eternal God enters time, temporal time as we know it. Uh, the infinite God, God is an infinite. Somehow, he who made all things becomes a thing. He, he becomes finite in a baby in Nazareth. And the immortal God who's immortal, okay, never dies, becomes mortal 
It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's unfathomable. It, it's, it's our human minds cannot fully grasp because it's so large that in time and space, God would enter our world of pain and change everything, you know, forever. And the only, the only other two events that compare to this in human history is the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection. But the incarnation is the, is the entry point. So, uh, so our invitation today is not just to experience Hark the Herald Angels Sings and all the joy of Christmas and, and all the good feelings that come with Christmas, but also at the same time to acknowledge it happened in a context of great pain in the world like we have today. So here's our text for today, Matthew 2, verses 13 to 16. And thus says the Lord, uh, when they had gone, this is a story of the Magi, when the Magi had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And when Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and younger. And so, you know, listen, listen in, in, in the 20th century, we had two world wars and six major genocides from the Turks to the Armenians, uh, Hitler with the Jews to the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, Pol Pot and what he did to his own Cambodian people, to the Serbs against the Albanians and the, and the uh, Muslims uh, there in Eastern Europe, to, uh, am I missing here? to the uh, Kurds uh, and in, in Northern Iraq when Saddam Hussein unleashed all hell on them, and then also the Tutsis and the, and the Hutus in Rwanda. And so we've, we've seen some genocides, but here in the first century we see a genocide. It's called the slaughter of the innocents. Uh, where Herod is not going to have any other king around. He hears about this baby, potentially a king. He just unleashes every baby under two in Bethlehem and his vicinity is to be killed and unleashes this small level genocide. And Matthew notes that. Uh, and this is the context in which Jesus came. And because uh, Herod was a madman. He was, you know, he was Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot. He was just, he was just, he was, he was neurotic. He was, uh, he was irrational. And uh, there was no way he was going to have anybody potentially touch his power. And, uh, and so we realize that, you know, here, here's one of the great paintings about J Jesus' flight to Egypt. It comes from a, an Asian artist. And it, it, it's, it's pointing out, you see Mary, Joseph, all, all the complexity in there. But what you want to see in the painting is, for him, the birth of Jesus, he's showing the dislocation, the, the brokenness, the, 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 the chaos that Jesus entered into when he was born on the first Christmas. And he's trying to bring that out, that displacement. Because you see, Jesus, uh, as he goes to Egypt, they leave for Egypt, Jesus was a refugee. Do you understand? He, he left his home, his country, and had to go to a place with his family, didn't speak the language, the culture, the food, and basically was dependent now, uh, like any other refugee, on the synagogue system of, of, his, of Egypt, basically for food, for shelter, to take care of him. I mean, they were refugees, and they had to, we don't know how many years they were in Egypt, but for a long time. And, uh, and then not only was he, uh, you know, in refugees, when, when Herod dies, they get ready to go back to, to Israel now. Now, I don't know how, let's say seven, eight years later. And then they heard that the son of Herod is now the king over Judea, which is where they're from, Bethlehem. And so they get a dream, having been warned in a dream, Joseph withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, we often pass over that. But Jesus was internally displaced as well. In other words, he had to move to a different part of Israel because there was a, there was a death warrant on him even in coming back years later. And so he ends up in a place called Nazareth. And we always say, oh yeah, Jesus of Nazareth. That's half his name is Jesus of Nazareth. What we forget is that Nazareth was nowheresville. Like Nazareth was such a small town, when they made a map of Galilee in the first century, it wasn't even on it. Okay, it was, it was so obscure uh, that was so unknown that it was like the slum of the slums. And when one of the disciples is called by Jesus, hears about Jesus in John 1, he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Like, it's, just a, it's a place for bumps. There's nothing there. And so, see, Jesus was a refugee, and Jesus was a nobody. 
in the world's eyes. It's very important that God came into a world of pain, but God also experienced the pain of the world himself in his own life and chose to come in that way and actually be born in a barn as well. What's, I, just a little side note here. It's just so interesting, isn't it, that you know, so much of our lives is spent trying to be somebody. Right? We're trying to say, hey, you know, I went to this school, and, you know, and I know, I'm, you know, I've got these many followers on Instagram, and you know, I know this person and that person, and I've, I've gone to this university, and I've got this level of degrees, and I've got these talents, and I know so-and-so and so-and-so, and, and I've got this kind of power in life, actually, this kind of authority. I've got money. I, you know, I've got possessions. We gotta, you know, my, my daughters are always saying it's called humble brag. I just learned that hashtag humble brag. You kind of throw things out in a humble way to say that you're somebody, you know? Oh, it was so hard to have all those people waiting for me after the show to say thank you, you know? Like, kind of, Helen, as you go speak, you know? It's murder to be famous, you know? It's, it's such, a, such an intrusion in my little life. I so prefer to be obscure, humble brag, you know? So I'll tell you one thing. This makes me realize that to, to try to be somebody and call ourselves a follower of Jesus is not congruent. Because he was very content in the love of the Father to be a nobody in the world's sight, that he might actually be somebody in God's sight. Very fascinating. But Matthew, when he records all this, Matthew's not overwhelmed by all the pain and horror that's in the world and that Jesus enters into because he understands that Caesar Augustus is not God. They thought the emperor of Rome was God. The Roman Empire was the most, most you know, colossal empire the world had ever known. I mean, they had, they had, they had taken Greek culture and imposed Greek civilization on, on the politics, on arts, on music, on education, athletics, religion. They, they had it all. And, and Jesus comes into this world obscure, and, and they were supposed to say, you know, Caesar is Lord. You know, glory and honor to the sovereign Lord. And then, and then you know, Jesus steps in the scene. It's like, no, no, no. Uh, he is the Lord God Almighty. There's a Lord you don't know about. Caesar isn't Lord. Jesus is Lord. And, all, and so Matthew's very much at peace. He empathizes with the tragedy, but he says... No, no, there's, there's something else going on here. And that is the fact that, that we have a God who's Lord, but not only is he Lord, he enters our pain. He enters our world, a, a real world. And so every effort to stamp out Jesus as he, from the very beginning with Herod fails because, as it says in John 1, uh, the light has shined in the darkness even now, and the darkness will never, ever destroy it, will never put out that light. And Herod tries in the very beginning, and all through history, there's been many attempts. And, and so it, it climaxes in, oh yeah, I'm sorry, let's show you this. This is, this, is a, this is a small town in Wyoming. It's got four people in it. And I thought, that's Nazareth, and you know, you're from Lost Springs, Wyoming, with four people, you know. Anyway, Jesus is a refugee, Jesus is a nobody. But, you know, his life climaxes. The world that Jesus created rejects him, misunderstands him, and crucifies him to get rid of him. And the worst, really, the, the worst event in human history is human beings created by God crucify God himself to get rid of them. They're, they're, you, want, you want to know, the, the humans have the capacity to do great evil. Just look at that. But the worst event in human history becomes the greatest event in human history. As God makes a way now, he dies for the sins of the world, and now the barrier between us and God is removed as he dies for our sins. We can actually, we're here because we can have access to God. And then all the barriers between us and each other are torn down and a whole new way opens up for us uh, through what supposedly was trying to put, get rid of Jesus. And so the worst event becomes the best event. And uh, because the central message of Christianity is that out of death comes life. Out of death comes life. And so we have a hope, the Bible calls it. There's something called biblical hope. And here's, here's, here's a definition just to kind of write down somewhere and, and ponder. Hope is the opposite of despair. Now, there's levels of hope and there's levels of despair. But hope is the confident and patient expectation in Jesus who works invisibly, in, through, and in spite of losses and evil. I'll say it again because it's so important. Hope is there's a confidence. Okay, things may be chaotic and falling apart. Again, here's Jesus in the midst of genocide, chaos, hatred. Uh, but there's a, a confidence in the book of Matthew, in the Gospels, uh, even for Joseph and Mary. There's a patient expectation, staying with Jesus, 
who works invisibly. Because you can't see, where's God, you know? How's he multiplying these loaves and fishes? Like, how's this wine going to work that never runs out? Like, you know, you can't quite see it. He works invisibly in, through, and in spite of losses and, and evil. And so, and he invites us to it. So a Christian says, with hope, we walk in the world, and, and, to, and we bring hope that says this. I don't know what's going on, but I can tell you this. Things will be okay. Let's offer it to Christ. Things will be, things will be good for you, for me, and for us. Despair without God walks in and says, this doesn't look good. Things will be bad for you, for me, and for us. So we offer into the world, we go into the world like Jesus. He sends us to bring hope into the world where there is none. And uh, let me just give you a couple of, of illustrations of what this looks like. In the 1300s, is one of the worst times in European history. In the 1300s, uh, in England, lived a woman named Julian of Norwich. Now, at that time, England was in a full-scale war with France that lasted 100 years. So that's a long war. They were in the middle of that. Secondly, the bubonic plague uh, was in full swing in Europe at that time. The bubonic, bubonic plague was like, well, they say almost half the population of Europe died. Entire towns were wiped out. Just to imagine half almost half the United States or half of New York City dying of this mysterious virus. Entire sections of the city being wiped out. I mean, just imagine the despair falling on a city, let alone a country, let alone all of Europe. And then thirdly, the church itself was in shambles. There was, we don't want to, the church was split into pieces and uh, there was all kinds of immorality and greed and embezzlement. And it was a bad scene of scandal on a very large scale. And so into this despairing moment emerges Julian of Norwich, who basically moves to be at what's called an anchoress. She, she takes on a role as an anchoress connected to a church to a life of prayer. Now, here's how, prayer is the voice of hope. As long as you're praying, you're hopeful. When you stop praying, you're moving down a different path of despair. But Julia of Norwich, she goes into this place of prayer, and she soon receives these visions of God. Jesus speaks to her. And she meditates on these visions for 20 years. And then she finally puts them in a, a, a book uh, called Revelations of, of uh, Divine Love. And very famous classic in Western spirituality. And here's what she writes. Now understand, Jesus is speaking these words to her. And here's what she writes. Or I'm sorry, here's what God says to her. All will be well. Now, I'll tell you one thing. When everything's falling apart, it's not easy to say all will be well. Or to affirm it. All will be well. And all will be well, says Jesus. And every kind of thing will be well. Considering all this, it seemed to me impossible that all manner of things should be well. Then she writes later, the Lord God showed me what is impossible to you is not impossible to me. I shall make all things well. I love that line. We say, it's impossible for anything well to come out of this horror over here, or this evil over here, or this genocide over there. I'm not minimizing that. And God says, I want you to know something. All will be well. I will make all. I know it's impossible for you to actually see it and imagine it, but all will be well. It's a tremendous truth. But the second person I want to bring you, who I think models this, is a fellow named Jean Vanier, because you see, Again, we are called to bear witness of hope in a world of pain. Jean Vallée, in, in the 1960s, was a prof early 60s, was a professor of philosophy, PhD, uh, and he had his first encounter with severely disabled, uh, mentally and intellectually disabled adults and in France. And he goes to a uh, psychiatric hospital for men and women who are severely disabled intellectually. And he realizes as he goes into this place that these are the most oppressed, in his opinion, the most oppressed people on the planet and how they're being treated. And he also would say later, the most forgotten people on the planet. And so what he does is he, he goes in the psychiatric institution and then he decides to invite two of the men to leave the psychiatric institution and live with him in a small apartment in a village in France, which he does. And as he's living with these, the names Raphael and Felipe, as he's living with these two men, 
he meets God in, in an incredible way. And uh, he writes about it. He goes, living with these men, men and women with mental disabilities, he writes, he goes, it helped me to discover what it means to actually live in communion with somebody. He goes, I didn't even know, he goes, I didn't even know how to have communion with a person until I met these two guys. And here's what he writes. To love someone is not first of all to do things for them, but to reveal to them their beauty and value. To say to them through our attitude, you are beautiful. You are important. I trust you. You can trust yourself. Now, you don't come to that kind of insight unless you go into a world of pain. But God showed up to him. I, I just love that by our attitudes. Talk about offering hope. But it took him entering in to that world of pain to get this kind of revelation insight. And now today there's hundreds of law arts communities, small ones, and homes for men and women with severe mental disabilities. It's tremendous work. But the final one I want to share with you is an uh, image of entering in, which I think offers a wonderful model for us, is those who are called the white helmets in Syria uh, today. Now, I have my white helmet here, so I'm going to put it on. Right here. I got it, second service. The white helmets are unarmed civilians in Syria who, at, when a building's being bombed, for example, in Aleppo right now, uh, they go into the building. Now, these folks are civilians. These are teachers, tailors, bankers, lawyers, you know, moms at home. These are just regular people that as neighborhoods are being bombed, they go into the neighborhood and they go into the bomb building to bring out the children or the adults who were there. And uh, they, uh, oh, almost 3,000 of them have, have died. But here you get a sense of the white helmets. Uh, risk their lives. There's nobody risking their lives on the earth today like these um, white helmets. Uh, now, they, they've saved 73,530 people so far in the last few years. And um, talk about extraordinary bravery and hope. But they don't withdraw. They actually go in to the place of pain and, you know, and to rescue, not knowing if a bomb is coming. Now, one of the most extraordinary rescues was of a little girl, um, a little a baby that was um, 10 days old and actually survived, was in, had been under rubble for 16 days. And what I'd like us to do, there they are right there, because my invitation to you is we are going to be white helmets this Christmas that we are going to look around to our sphere of influence, those who are in pain, friends, families, neighbors, strangers you'll meet, because they're everywhere, right? You're going to be with your family this Christmas, perhaps. There's some pain there. Your friends and strangers and co-workers, and we go as white helmets, and we go in the name of Jesus to offer hope of a confidence and a certainty, and a patience, even if we don't have to utter the words because sometimes it's not appropriate to say anything, but we go in there with a sense of Jesus is here. He has come. So what I want us to do is we're going we're gonna to watch a video, and it's a minute and a half video, and it's the video on YouTube. We're going to pick it up when they actually, the guy has just heard an, about an hour earlier, he has heard a cry of a baby. Now, the baby's been there. Now, the bomb came like 14, 15 hours earlier. He hears a baby cry. He can't even believe it. So he brings a friend over and says, did you hear what I heard? And um, so he comes over, and you're going to pick it up right here in the scene on YouTube when they go find that child. And so we are the white helmets. And uh, we go into a world of pain, and we bring a message of Jesus, that there is always, always, always light, no matter how dark it may feel for people, and that there is always, always, always hope, no matter how much despair the situation may appear to have. But we go, and we are the white helmets, everybody, and we offer this Christmas, not simply us having a nice Christmas, we are bringing hope, and we bear witness to Jesus in a world that's in a lot of pain. So 
to do that well, it's important, I want to close the service, that we are in touch with our own pain and losses. In other words, if we're not a feeling people, as it's been rightly said, the degree to which you grieve your own losses is the degree to which you're able to grieve with others. That compassionate people are those who have shed the most tears because they understand loss experientially and then they can bring it to others as well. So we're going to sing, uh, we're going we're gonna to sing a, a very famous song. Put the words up. Um, o come, O come, Emmanuel. And uh, you know the song. Uh, it's a great, famous Christmas song. But it's a Christmas song written uh, in the context of exile and pain and despair. Uh, exile, you read the word exile, or captive Israel. You know, in their worst time, lonely exile. And, and at the end, a friend, Emmanuel means God with us. Every stanza, you can see, O come, O come, uh, O rod of Jesse. Rod of Jesse refers to King Jesus. It's, every one of these phrases, they'll talk, O thou day spring. That refers to King Jesus. Desire of the nations, O King Jesus. Every first line is, G O come, O come, Jesus. But it gives a different biblical name for his person. So I'm going to invite you, we're going to, you know, they're going to sing it for us. And then uh, I want to invite you to just join in as, your, uh, as you like. And just allowing, allowing it to be our voice of hope. Our voice of recognition that we serve a God who entered the pain of the world. And really felt it as a refugee and a nobody. Really was in the midst of, his own, of, a, of their own genocide. He was a fugitive, an outlaw. Okay, and, and, and considered a nobody his whole life, and yet he enters our world. And so let's enter our own pain, and then we'll take it from there. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Shall come. 
I'd like us now to uh, take, I'm going to offer you, I'm going to take two minutes and we're going to be still before the Lord. And I'd like you to do this in this two minute frame. Uh, Kate will play. I want you to, to ponder what are, what's your role as a white helmet, you know, for Christ this Christmas? Like what are the losses and the pain that's around you? Now it may be you, which is fine. Uh, it may be coworkers, it may be family, it may be neighbors, it may be friends, it may be Syria, it may be some larger event going on in the world. And I wanna ask that you're gonna, we're gonna all be white helmets even in, in this two minutes of silence. And because the question is, what's God asking you to do this Christmas as a white helmet? And so prayer is one of the you know, greatest, greatest expressions of that. So what I do is I'll, I'll, I'll take a person, a friend, maybe not doing well physically, and I'll just hold them before God. I say, Lord, I just, I just present them before the Lord. I, I don't even have a lot of words. I say, oh, God, your kingdom come. But I'm, I'm holding them before God. If I get older, I have less words to say. Because I, I, I know less of what's going on. But I, I hold them before God. And so I want to invite you to do the same in this two minutes. Whatever those pains are that are inside of you or around you, that you might, maybe God's asking you to be a white helmet. So I'll be the timekeeper. And I just bow your heads and maybe just open up your hands up like this. Kind of just an open expression. You're just open to, to be a vessel of a white helmet right now for the people that you influence. So let's begin. I'm going to invite you all to stand with me. So we enter in, right? We, we go in with our white helmets, you know, in the name of Jesus. And what I love about that video was when that baby came out and the roar of the people, and they handed that baby back to the mother. And so we, we do, uh, as we get deeper in hope, there is a, a great rejoicing. It's not just grief and we enter into pain but we actually come out the other side that there is resurrection, there is life. And so we're gonna sing this great song and I want us to close with it. You know, we, we, you know put the words up if you could, uh, Josephine. And, and uh, you know, I've decided to wait on you, Lord. That's how I wait on you, my rock and my redeemer, my shield and reward. It's, it's a decision we make. And we go with our white helmets, whatever situation you may be walking into as you leave this place. Let's sing it together. Let me invite the prayer team to come forward uh, to your left. And we've got the Lord's table over here to eat and drink of Christ. And we've got our prayer teams. Now, listen, I, you know, it's a continuum, right, of, of despair and hope. And, and so if you're here today and you recognize, I'm, I'm just, you're, you're carrying, uh, let's say on a scale of one to 10, you're carrying some discouragement. You may not be in despair, but you're just, you're very discouraged. You say, I can't really see anything. I can't see light at the end of the tunnel. 
And uh, so sometimes we need to be carried by other people in those seasons. And I want to invite you to come for prayer. I have been carried many a time where I've been in situations where I just couldn't see. I was in a valley and I could not see any light at the end of the tunnel. And, uh, and so you just, that's why you need the community, you need the body of Christ. So come forward for prayer because hope is a supernatural phenomenon. I mean, I don't know how you got here today, but it's God's grace you're in this room today. But it's God who infuses us with hope. It, it's a miraculous thing. I mean, words are good, but the Spirit of God drives it home to us. And that's why pr- the power of prayer comes in. So uh, as we close, uh, you need Christ to fill you. You need hope. You need the Spirit of God to do something in you to be able to be patient and confident and expectant of Jesus who works in, through, and in spite of evil going on around you. And that you can hang in there and wait on him, as we just sang. Please come forward for prayer and let us pray for you. All right? So let's close. I invite you to open your hands again, once again, towards heaven. Let's pray a prayer of blessing, and you'll be dismissed. Our prayer teams will be here. So as you put on your white helmet, in Christ's name, May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine on you. And may the Lord fill you with a a deep certainty, a deep patience, a, a deep hope that he has come and that the Lord is here and that all will be well because of him. And may the Lord give you the grace with words, without words, as you leave this place and go into the sphere of your influence, family, friends, work, neighbors, may you be a sign and a wonder of this hope to the world. May you be sent by Jesus as a little Christ, as an extension of his incarnation, as the body of Christ, and by your very presence, bring hope and life to those you touch in our world of So I bless you in Jesus' name as you leave this place. And everybody said, amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.